Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the Beekeepers Association of uh, Southern California, or BASC as we are known. <laughs> For all those people who uh, are new here, it's nice to see some new faces. Um, what we're going to do this evening is we're going to have uh, our speaker, Peter Borst, from uh, Cornell University, uh, talk to us about uh, splitting hives, which is uh, absolutely uh, topical because this is what we're going to have to do pretty soon, particularly when our bees come back from uh, the almonds. Our guest speaker this evening, um, Peter started selling bee equipment in 1974. He, um, was a senior um, he is the senior apiarist for Cornell's Dice Lab for Bee Research. Um, he was an inspector for New York, New York State, uh, bee inspector for New York State. He is a regular contributor to the American Bee Journal and the vice president of the Finger Lakes Bee Club. Um, he enjoys traveling around the country giving presentations to local bee clubs like ours. And I'd like us all to welcome Peter Morst. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'm just going to go over that a little bit more because um, there's a little more to it than that. I actually was uh, raised, uh, born in the East, but I grew up in San Diego. So uh, th this is my club over here in the corner. Uh, I was in the San Diego Beekeepers Club for, for many years back in the 70s and part of the, part of the 80s. Uh, in 1990, I moved to, to New York State. Uh, nobody understands why somebody from San Diego would move to New York State. But actually, my ancestors are from New York State, and, and I actually first got interested in beekeeping in upstate New York. But most of my experience um, with beekeeping is in San Diego County. Um, I, I'm not a doctor, I, and I've also never played one on TV. But um, somehow it's come out because I work at Cornell, everyone assumes that I'm a doctor. But I, I actually uh, got a really nice job working at the uh, bee lab, the dice lab for honeybee research. And I was very honored to have, be a, the lab, you know, lab manager there. I was working for the professor and I was, you know, I don't have any degrees. Uh, all that I know about beekeeping, I learned uh, the hard way, you know, by doing it. And of course, in the in the later years, I've spent a lot of time doing a lot of research, um, researching other people's work. I don't do any experiments myself. I'm not Randy Oliver. He's doing the experiments that everybody wants to have done. And Randy and I are great friends, and I think it's fabulous the work that that he is doing. But the kind of research that I do is mainly the old-fashioned, where you read stuff and digest it and try to put it back into uh, a form that other people can enjoy and get something out. But anyway, to make a long story short, I have been working, um, writing articles for the American Bee Journal for the past couple of years, and so most of the topics that I discuss publicly have already been worked into an article. In fact, when I get a, a call um, locally in New York State to do a, a workshop or something like that, First thing I'll do is I'll I'll write an article about it, and um, that way I you know get familiar with the topic, get focused on the topic, and then when I get up in front of people, <coughs> I don't put my foot in my mouth. Um, well, I do sometimes. Can we dim the lights a little bit so the picture looks better? Is that going to be okay with your camera? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I, I, he mentioned I worked as a uh, a bee inspector in New York State. Um, I worked at the bee lab for about seven years and really didn't get along that well with the professor. He was one of those people that knew a lot, but when he got right down to practical beekeeping, he wasn't very smart about it. And uh, things would go wrong because of the planning. Um, and, and you know, if things are not planned properly, then they usually go down, they usually fall apart. And then I got blamed because things fell apart because he hadn't planned them properly. So finally, I got old, and I worked for a while as a, a state inspector. Uh, state, state inspector is really a cool job if you can ever get it because you see more more colonies in more different situations. You see more beekeepers with more levels of uh, understanding than just about any other way that you could learn beekeeping. So, so basically, I've done a lot of different things. You know, you might say too many things. You know, I've, I've worked as a commercial beekeeper. I've worked as a selling bee supplies. I worked doing research. And now I'm down to about eight hives in my backyard. And frankly, that's a nice number. I like that. I have fun with that. And so, so I'm not here to try to promote large-scale beekeeping. I'm here to talk about ways that people in this room, you know, can, can do stuff. So none of this is like, is starting at the beginning, of course, this is the way beekeeping was, was kept for, for thousands of years. 
And this, of course, is a contemporary pictures. So that reminds you that beekeeping is still kept this way in many parts of the world. Uh, bees are still kept this way in many parts of the world. Basically, it's a hive. It's your proverbial black box. They don't know what's going on inside of there. All they know is that at a certain time of year, they can get honey out of that. Or in some cases, uh, they actually eat brood. Um, so, so some bees are kept for the honey and the brood. And uh, typically, these hives swarm. And so dividing hives is basically waiting around for the hives to swarm. And then hopefully, you'll catch one of these swarms. Although with this type of hive, it's very common for bees to just move right into them. Because bees, when they're swarming, as you know, they're looking for a, a place to live. So beekeeping, at, you know, as it progressed, uh, became more technical. Here we have a basket hive, which is basically the same thing we just looked at, except it's turned this way. And um, the beekeeping technique didn't change very much. They'd sit around waiting for the bees to swarm, try to catch one of those. This is very handy because you turn it upside down, it becomes a basket. And you can dump the bees into it and then turn it back over again. And the bees think they got their, they, th they think that they got there on their own. They didn't realize that they were dumped into the basket and go to work. Um, and so, so at, I don't know if you guys know very much about skep beekeeping, but typically what they would do in the fall is they would half the hives. They would see who's heavy and, and who's light. And then they would take the, the heavy ones and they would kill those because those are too good to pass up. That's full of honey, you know. That, I'm taking that honey. And, and there's a certain wisdom to that because if a hive is completely full of honey, there's a pretty good chance that they've cut the queen back and she hasn't been laying for the past couple of months and the population may be mostly older bees. So anyway, they eliminate the heavy ones, then they would take the light ones and, and weigh those. Now, well, they're not going to make it anyway, so they would take the honey from those. And in the process, all, uh, I left out the part, they, all these bees are killed. They, they hold the skeck over a, a pit of burning sulfur. The bees fall out and die. And so then they're stuck with a, you know, maybe one third to one half empty hives. So the idea that you know, beekeepers you know, lose a lot of bees, that's, this is not a new thing. In those days, they lost bees at their own hand. They would cut back by a third to a half of the hives, thinking we're going to only try to winter over hives that are in good shape, that are likely to make it. And then in the following spring, we're going to fill the bees hives back up with swarms. This was just how it was done. So in those days, dividing hives was based on the fact that bees divide themselves anyway. They swarm, they catch the swarms, and where you had two hives, now you have four or five. And that was pretty good. Um, but as time went on, they became more interested in what was actually going on and wanted to learn how to divide hives on their own. So you can see this hive is did you have a question? Where are these? These are actually in uh, um, San, San Anselmo, in Marin County. Oh. So this, these pictures I took, most of the pic I would say about half the pictures you're going to see today, I did not take. But these I actually did. This is in, in San Anselmo, and this guy makes these things as a hobby. And he has a, an acre of about six of these things. And um, as you can see, as they progressed, they, they hit upon the idea of, 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 of adding an upper story, or in some cases they'll, they'll add the story below it. In other words, ex expanding the, the size of this thing, which gives you two things. It gives you an opportunity to increase the capacity of the hive as it grows, and it also gives you the opportunity to split this hive. So you can see just a, an ordinary, excuse me, an old-fashioned way of splitting a hive was to take this part and set it over here. And as everyone knows, if they have brood and eggs, the half that's queenless will make a new queen and you have two hives where there was one. Here, here you can see how the thing separates into two, two units. This one was added on top because you can see here there's a hole where the bees go up into the second, second story. And so it can be used either as a, a super where the, they put the surplus honey or it can be uh, used as a unit to set, set off and produce a new hive. Uh, here's, here's one that's a wicker, a wicker hive with a clay exterior. And this is in March. That hive is ready to split. Mm -hmm. you know, if, you, if you have a colony like that, that strength in March, you're doing something right. And here's another picture of the same gentleman. Actually, these bees were extremely docile. He was the only one that was suited up. There was myself and uh, an, a, a, another woman, and we didn't have any protective gear on at all, although we were using uh, plenty of smoke. Um, so then, you know, as time went on, they, they thought they were making great improvements. You know, it would be it would be fancier, 
a fancier, uh, you know, uh, uh, form of basically the same thing. Um, and they just got fancier and fancier with more c compartments. And this was really not improving beekeeping at all. It was, it was making hives more expensive. But in terms of the science and the understanding of beekeeping, we were getting nowhere fast. So it wasn't until the Langstroth invention of the frame, and now we could we could talk all night about who actually invented the frame. There were frames invented in Europe about the same time. Uh, the Russians believed that they were the first ones to invent. Actually, it was in the Ukraine, I think, that the, 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 the they think that they were the first ones to invent the frame. Uh, the frame was an idea just waiting for its time to happen. So if, if Langstroth hadn't invented it, someone else would have, and it caught on very fast because it gave people an opportunity to to control the highs and by control I mean you had you're able to move frames around you'd be able to look inside you'd be able to understand what's going on in there so it's no longer this black box where you know stuff happens and nobody knew what was really going on as a matter of fact I just like as an aside it it took pretty near until the 1600s before uh, beekeepers realized that that big bee you know the one that's in charge of everything that's not the king it's the queen, you know. So, having access to the inside of the hive really made it possible for people to understand a lot more about what was going on inside of the hive. But you, as you can see, this is still a complicated, fussy little hive. Uh, Langstroth's idea was to have ten frames in the lower story, and then on top they would either have uh, uh, what they called a crown board, which might have a half a dozen or ten holes in the top, and they would put jars over them, mm -hmm. and the bees would come up and build the honey into the jar, which is really cool, you know, it's right in there, and you just get the bees out of there, and you've got a jar full of honeycomb. And, and then they, they realized they could get more honey by having them uh, build the combs in square boxes. So that's that's where you've got your, your comb honey. And in, in, in the 1850s to 1880s, all honey was sold in the comb. And that's the way people expected it. They didn't expect to get honey in a jar. This was a new idea when, when people started, you know, extracting honey. They, they, as a matter of fact, when the extractor was invented, a lot of people thought that was going to just destroy the honey market. This honey would be cheap and, and easy to get. Everyone would have it, and no one would want to pay much for it. But um, and it, and even today, comb honey is still sought after by a lot of people because it's a fancy, uh, you know, really unique product. I mean, it's nothing more amazing than looking at it chunk of comb honey and going, wow, bees did that, you know. So, um, as I was saying, once we had the frame hive, any child could manipulate bees, and uh, she, she, of course, has the queen in her hand, and she has complete control over the hive uh, as a re... I'm not sure that's a girl. <laughs> <laughs> and again, here's the same, same idea. Um, early on, there was a lot of different size and shape frames. You know, it took a long time before the frame was really standardized, and uh, it's an odd shape. I mean, it's an odd size. You know, what a, the a high body is 19 and 5 eighths by 16 and a quarter or something like that. I think Langstroth had a packing crate that he made the original hive out of, and it was standard on the standardized on the size of some packing crate. Um, so, so one of the things that, of course, that they they thought of doing right from the start was was increasing the number of hives they had. And um, there's a very, very interesting principle that is going to come out of this talk that I want you to understand, is that, is that one hive not divided will build up to a certain uh, level of population that produce honey, etc. But if you divide hives, especially if you divide the hives up into a lot of hives, you're going to get a lot, uh, uh, proportionally a lot more bees out of the whole unit. Because smaller colonies have this strong desire to bring themselves back up to the normal strength. So um, that, I just want you to hold that in your mind. It's the idea of, that dividing hives is a beneficial thing and uh, to the colonies. So this is actually in up, upstate New York. This guy supposedly had 700 colonies at the home yard. This was before people really they, they didn't want to put you know, they didn't want to get in a, in a wagon in those cases. They didn't have trucks. They didn't want to get in a wagon and drive halfway across the county and work bees. They wanted them all in the home yard. But once, once the idea of moving bees to out yards caught on, they realized this is a much better plan you know, to have 50 or 100 here or 20 and 30 here instead of having them all in the home yard. I mean, can you imagine at, at wash day when she hangs out the, the sheets on the um, clotheslines? 
This is another picture of this uh, same yard, Saint, uh, Alexander. This is up near Albany, New York. And um, I'm, I'm from New York. Nobody has these things anymore. You know, uh, the large, largest apiaries in New York State that I've ever seen have been 30-something. They don't have hundreds of hives in one spot. A typical New York State apiary is 20, 24, or, or 12 is common. Yeah. Having such a concentration of hives, uh, do you think that they would have been very productive? Yeah, they, they produce phenomenal crops of honey, but there's a, a, a particular reason for that. In upstate New York in the 1800s, late 1800s, was the buckwheat region. And buckwheat is one of the most prolific honey plants in the world. And so these, these guys were making a, a comfortable <coughs> living with, um, off of buckwheat honey. So they basically they got honey from clover, the, what they call the white Dutch clover, you know, the little ones with the clovers, <coughs> clovers that grow low on the ground. So they produce huge crops of white clover and then this buckwheat. And these are crops that you could put in the ground and get and harvest, whether it would be hay or in the case of buckwheat, you're harvesting the buckwheat seeds, right? These are crops that you can put in the ground and harvest within 60 days. This is a big bonus for New York State because in the old days, it would rain all spring and sometimes you couldn't even get the plow on the ground until the end of June. And this is crappy weather. Um, and then, so you got the crop in June, you've got July and August, to, to grow and produce and go to seed, and then the frost would start hitting in September. So it's basically, it's an ideal crop for a two-month growing season. Now, you know, with global warming, I think the, the growing season has increased to three months, but <laughs> not much more than that. So, so back to the, the topic today, you know, we're going to talk about dividing colonies. And, and uh, my, the, the title of my article is there's more... Uh, Oh, yeah. More than one way to split a hive. In fact, there's just millions of ways, and every beekeeper has their own favorite way. And, you know, we, we, we could talk all night about all the different ways, but I'm going to try to just focus on a few ways of splitting hives and, um, you know, the, the benefits and the downsides of each. Uh, th these pictures here are, were sent to me by a friend of mine uh, in, who lives in Chile, um, who we c I've never actually met, but we've communicated bunches of times over the, over the email. And uh, so he's getting ready to split hives. Those are those are four or five frame nuke boxes. Has anybody not seen a four or five frame nuke box before? Never seen one before? You've all seen them, right? So this is nothing new, right? Okay, so this is an ideal unit for, for starting out colonies. Here, here, here it shows him uh, getting ready to make splits. In the back, you've got your colonies. In the, in the front, you've got your, your nukes you're making. So, so the first, really, the first beekeeper that I worked for that was splitting bees in a large, large way. Uh, this was in like 1975, I think, and he had bees in El Centro, Brawley, down in Brawley, El Centro area, and he would bring the the hives back over to the coastal so, uh, Southern California. And he was actually a second generation beekeeper. His dad used used to do that. He'd take the whole family over to Carlsbad, and they would camp out on the beach in tents. And during the day, they would go work the bees, and in the evening, they would sit around the, the, the campfires and wait for the grunion to run. And, uh, you know, I mean, can you imagine what a life that, you know? But, but the, of course, the downside was that then they would take the bees back to Brawley, where it gets to be 125 degrees all summer long. Um, so anyway, basically, there, they would lose up to 50% of their colonies. This was back in the 60s and 70s. They would lose 50% of their colonies in the summer. Why? Does anybody know why they would lose half their bees in the summertime? Temperature. Yeah, they just cook. You know, I mean, if a, if a queen goes out to mate, there's about a, a zero chance she's ever going to make it back. Uh, <laughs> there's just so many ways for bees to, to die in that kind of a temperature. Um, they would set these bees out on alfalfa, and basically it was a race to see if you could get a crop of honey before the bees either cooked or, or died from pesticides. Pesticides was a huge problem back in the 60s and 70s. And, well, in malathion, parathion, uh, all these different chemicals, pesticides is not a new thing. But in those days, beekeepers basically thought, you know, this is just the cost of doing business. You know, there's not much I can do about this. And uh, so they, you know, they weren't crying to the government, you know, to get this and that and the other thing banned. They, they basically, they got a, they worked out a plan with the government to get, uh, indemnified. So if you had an out-and-out -out pesticide kill, you could get a check from the government based on how many dead hives you had. But it took only a couple of years for people to get wise to the idea 
that they were actually turning in the same dead hives year after year. <laughs> not a good plan. It's not a, what do you call a sustainable plan? Um, so anyway, make a long story short, he would take the remaining live hives over to the coast and to put them in, into avocado orchards, uh, in the chaparral, where stuff is coming into bloom. That's back in the days when it used to rain. And um, then he would bring all the dead hives over on the next truckload, uh, and, and he would set them in long rows. Uh, picture like 50 hives, another 50 hives, another 50 hives, and then he would go down these rows and he, and, I, and, and right behind the row of live colonies, he would set a row of dead colonies. The same thing would repeat. And so then what we did was we would take the live colony, which is a two-story colony typically at that point, and uh, take the lid off, smoke the dickens out of it, so most of the bees come up to the upper story, and then we would set the upper story off on the first story of the dead colony. So essentially we've done nothing different than what we just saw with the skep hive, the two, the two story skep hive. So in, in 100 years we've got really gotten nowhere. We're just splitting hives by taking half the bees and putting them in another hive. I've gotten a little bit smarter about it. Um, see the idea of smoking the bees into the upper story is that you're driving 80% uh, of the bees and probably the queen into the upper story and that gets set over on the, to the new stand and you know that a lot of the bees are going to fly back to the old stand so you basically you've, you put, you've pushed the majority of the bees into the split knowing that a lot of them are going to fly back with the idea that we're, we're, we're shooting for a 50-50 split here okay and so then you say well what happens to the uh, part with no queen well of course they, they're, it's their job now to raise a queen and um, you know make her make themselves right, and does this work? It doesn't always work. It's true. I would say probably anywhere from 90% success if you're lucky. In other words, 10% of those hives did not successfully queen themselves, down to 50% if you're not lucky. You have bad weather. Uh, you have drifting. You have all kinds of problems that can come up that prevent those colonies from successfully requeening. But for him, he said the success rate was high enough that it made it worthwhile. And you could teach anyone to do it. You could have people that were, you know, knew nothing, couldn't even, couldn't even speak. You could show them how to do it. You pick the box up, you carry it over. You just do this over and over again. And he said the only improvement that he thought was worth making was if you had queen cells available, you could put queen cells in the one that didn't have the queen. And presumably that would be the one on the original stand because you smoked all the bees into the upper story. But so we're talking about a very unscientific approach, right? So that's just basically, um, you know, one way of splitting hives that requires almost no, no uh, uh, understanding. So, so really, the traditional way of doing it is is to actually find the queen, like this guy's trying to find the queen, and um, take three or four frames of brood out of your colony, put them into a nuke box, and add a queen. Um, so there's basically, I would say, there's three ways of handling the problem of the queen. The first way, of course, is that you just let them take care of themselves, which they will do, but it's on a percentage. Uh, you know, if you make nukes, three or four frame nukes, you can make them all day long, taking brood out of your colonies uh, and um, setting them off in another location, preferably, and they will make their own queens. And, and one of the issues that comes up is uh, what kind of a queen are they going to make? Uh, just thrown in a box like that. And one of the one of the problems that people immediately latch onto is is will the larva be the right age? Because uh, a, a queen is raised from a larva, as we all know, that was destined to be be a worker bee. So f the egg is indistinguishable between a queen and a worker. It's indistinguishable. And after three days, it hatches, and during those first three days, they have the opportunity to to be a queen or to be a worker. And the longer it goes down that path as a worker, the less it's likely it's going to be to be a good queen. In other words, it's the same genes, the same egg. You guys know all this stuff, right? It depends upon how it's fed. And it's not just whether it gets royal jelly or not, because both the worker bee and the queen get royal jelly. And it's not just how much worker jelly, royal jelly they get, because even though the queen gets a lot more royal jelly, than the worker bee, we think that there's differences in the chemical composition 
of that jelly, which triggers the changes that de develop that egg into a queen versus that egg into a worker. So, for example, if it's too far down the path as a worker, maybe too late to be switched over to be a viable queen. It'd be what we call an inner cast. It's like a little bit more like a worker bee than maybe it ought to be. So we, we know that workers have ovaries, just the same as a queen. So they have functional <coughs> ovaries. In a worker, the ovaries are, are, are very small and not, not really useful, except for I think that they produce uh, hormones and, and possibly pheromones <coughs> that, that, that workers use to, to communicate with the rest of the hive. So it's not just that wor workers have ovaries by chance. They, they do also have functions. But anyway, to make a long story short, if you just throw bees in a box, you have no control over the age of those larvae. And we've, we've studied this a little bit, and we found out that pretty much the bees will not pick an egg that, or a larva that's too old. So it's not really that much of a problem. If you study it, you know, they, they're pretty smart about that. They seem to know that a very young, 24 to 48 old larvae is what they should pick to produce a, 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 a good queen. So they do that pretty reliably. So I don't, I'm not going to stand here and say throwing bees in a box, brood and honey won't work. It will work. And you're probably going to get a pretty good queen. The problem really is more, when she flies off to mate, maybe she doesn't come back. So that's an issue. But that's an issue no matter what type of mating system that you use. If you're going to have the queen mate on your ter territory, you're running the risk that she's never coming back. Okay, so then the second approach, we've got three approaches. We've got bees raise their own queen. The second approach is you buy a queen cell from somebody. Now this is really a, a great improvement over what we just talked about for several reasons. One, when a guys produce queen cells, does every, anybody know anybody that produces queen cells to sell? You know, yeah, so you haven't heard of this. There are people in uh, Southern California that sell, uh, that raise queen cells. I did it back in the 80s. I used to raise a couple thousand a week and sell them. They were just a day before hatching. It's just like selling chicken eggs, you know, they, they hatch on a certain day. And the thing that a beekeeper raising <coughs> queen cells has control over is, is A, he's got control over the age of that larva. We only ever grafted larvae that were between 24 and 36 hours old. And the way we knew this is because of the size. They, they grow extremely quickly. And so uh, uh, an egg is a certain size that hatches out, uh, uh, immediately hatched out larvae is about the size of the egg. You know how big they are, you can almost not see them, right? So as it grows, it gets more and more visible. By, by 48 hours, it's, it's about three times as large. So it's not, it's not a subtle difference. Man, this guy's three times as large. And, and so basically what you want to do if you're grafting queens, and somebody in this room will eventually learn to do that, uh, what you basically do is pick up the one that's almost too small. It's one guy, I don't want to pick that one up, it's too small. That's the one. Um, and that's the one that's going to develop into a good queen. So the deal with buying queen cells is that you've got all these queen cells due to hatch on a particular day. So you're introducing uh, a, a queen cell that's about to hatch um, into a nuke. You've gained a lot of time on that because your, your nuke where you just threw the bees together in a box, they had to develop that queen, get that queen mated, and get that queen laying again. And that takes like three or four weeks sometimes. So by buying a queen cell, you've already shortened that period that that colony is in trouble by about 10 days, 10, 12 days. Because this thing was due to emerge when you got it. And um, so there's a certain art to introducing queen cells. It's not easy. This is not like introducing uh, queens in, mating, in, in mailing cages. You know, you, buy, you can buy queens through the mail in a little mailing cage. Introducing queen cells is a lot more touchy. Mm -hmm. They're very sensitive to temperature changes. You put them on the dashboard, they'll just melt into a big pile. Um, also, bees are not as, uh, as likely to accept a queen cell as a queen in a mating cage uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, one, it, it's foreign, uh, but on your, on, on, on your, in your favor is that when the queen first hatches out of that cell, She's a virgin queen. She gives off very, very small light odor. So they, they, it is very possible that they won't even notice her and she'll catch out and roam around in that hive 
long enough to get the odor of that hive, and then they'll just say, "Wow, that was that was good." You know, we 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 got this queen here. You know, where did that come from? But uh, anyway, but it's, you're still stuck with the problem: is this queen's got to go off to mate, and queens typically mate several times over a period of several days. So that means that day after day, there's a chance she's going to get picked off by a crow or or anything could happen. She could land on on somebody's windshield. Um, so the third prospect of, of making a, uh, introducing a queen, of course, is you buy a queen in the mailing cage uh, from a supplier. And you can get queens from from all kinds of places. They, they, you can get them out of Hawaii almost, uh, what, 12 months out of the year. They sell queens in Hawaii. Um, there's more, more seasonal uh, queen rearing in Northern California. I think their season runs from, from, from March until, you know, uh, about June uh, to get good queens. Uh, same thing with uh, the Deep South. They they make a, have a big business selling queens. And these queens, of course, are bred queens. Like like a dog is bred. Like you, you got pedigrees. You got you got uh, breeds. You know you got your carniol and you got your Italians. Now there's a bit of it's a bit of a joke because these things were I imported back in the in the 1800s and they haven't been imported since 1920. So they've kind of gotten homogenized a little bit. It's, you know, it's a little bit like going to the, the kennel and, and picking out a dog that sort of halfway looks like a collie. Maybe it's not really a collie, but you know, it's good enough for me. That's as much collie as I need. Um, <laughs> so that, that's you know the pedigrees of these beasts. In fact, in fact, somebody asked me, what, well, what's the difference between an Italian and a Carniola? And I think maybe it's just color, right? And, and, and maybe it is in California, and I've heard people say, you know, it was a yellow one we sell it as an Italian, if it's a black one we sell it as Carniolan, you know. And, and there's a certain amount of truth to that because these bees in their native range, they both come from the Alps. And in the, in the region of, of uh, the Alps where the Carniolans is, uh, originated, it's only like about 200 miles from their region, and the Alps where the Italians came from. They're on the other side of the ridge, and, and they, were, they were predominantly orange, and the, and the Carniolans were predominantly black, but the breeders got a hold of them and they go, well, these are not black bees, these are orange bees. And they bred for color over the centuries, they bred for color, and the, meanwhile, the Carniolans, the, the, they bred them to be not Italians. So they kind of, you know, they kind of inf reinforced this color distinction. But in terms of temperament, I don't think there's a very much different. So, moving. Here's, here's, I like to talk a little bit about uh, the strength of the nukes. Uh, okay, so, so s the strength of the nukes is a very, very interesting topic. Uh, if you, it depends upon what your goal is here. So, so normally when you're dividing colonies, it's in the springtime, and your principal goal goals are, one, you want to make new colonies, and two, you're trying to retard the swarming impulse. So these colonies are going to divide anyway, whether you divide them or not. The, per, the whole idea of dividing the colonies is to get it onto your schedule, do it in your equipment, do it onto your time. Because if you don't do it, they're gonna, probably going to swarm anyway. And I actually am talking about swarming tomorrow night in another location. So I'm not going to go into swarming and what causes swarming uh, tonight. But um, if you want to get in on that, we can get the address, right? Yes, absolutely. Tomorrow yeah. night in Glendora, everybody yeah. come to see... Uh, that, that talk is all about swarming, why be swarm, and what to do about it. But wh what to do about it is, is a part and parcel of dividing bees. One of the best ways of, of taking the urge of swarming out of the colony is to steal brood at, at, at the period when they're going to be swarming. And uh, pretty much everyone knows when they're, when they're going to be swarming. If you've been around bees long enough, you know there's kind of a season for swarming. And it's different for every area, so I'm not going to say what, what, what date it starts on. You know, in my area, it starts in May. So they have the old adage. I don't know if you heard of it. A swarm in May is worth a load of hay. A swarm in uh, June, a silver spoon. But a swarm in July, not worth a fly. But see, you're going to have to translate that to to uh, Southern California East. Um, I, I understand swarming starts in February here sometimes, maybe even January if you get the right conditions, right? Mm -hmm. But the principle is the same. The colonies start to grow, they start to feel prosperous, they want to swarm. And swarming is their way of splitting the colonies. So if they didn't do this, you know, we wouldn't have bees everywhere. Uh, you know, this is their way of, of 
procreating colonies. You know, they have a way of procreating bees. This is the way they have procreating colonies. So, so in terms of um, nukes, we're forming nukes now. Um, if you take three or four frames of bees right out of the brood nest, that really takes the wind out of their sails. And you'll, you'll, you'll replace these frames with empty frames, or uh, either with foundation or comb. Um, I always had a problem with introducing foundation to the brood nest. It seemed like then they wanted to fill it with honey. And really, I'd rather have the queen be, be laying in those combs. Um, so I like to use drawn comb, uh, dark drawn comb. Stick that in the brood nest. Everywhere you took out a frame of brood, put in the dark drawn comb so that the queen immediately starts laying in that so you don't have an interruption in the brood rear. Some people have better luck introducing foundation. It's sort of like whatever works for you type of thing. You know, what you want is to get that queen laying again and you, what you don't want is for that frame to get filled with honey because that just acts as a barrier to them, you know, repopulating the brood nest. So if you take three or four frames out of the colony in the springtime, like I said, it takes a lot of the swarming impulse out of them. You can do this over and over again, actually. This is one thing that people don't realize. You can steal brood, and when I say steal brood, I'm talking about the brood and the bees on it. Okay, so you don't just take the brood. You want to take the brood and all the bees that are on it because they're going to care for that brood. And the principle is that we're taking brood and bees. In, in shorthand, I'm just saying brood. But what I mean is brood and bees. So we're, we're taking these frames of brood out. You can do this two, three, four, five times even if you're, if you're careful about it. And, and the reason I know this is because I worked in the package bee industry in the 80s and we took bees out of those, we shook bees out of that, which is not the same, but in principle it's the same. We shook bees out of that. The first time we shook a little bit out of each colony, then each time we came back we shook more and more. And you're wondering, where the, where the hell are all these bees coming from? And the principle is if you think about giving blood, you can give blood every, what is it, every six, 60 days, 90 days? Six weeks. Yeah, yeah. So you, wh where's all this blood? You can give your entire blood supply you know, over a certain period of time, and you're fine. So the principle here is you're taking these bees out, and immediately what they do is they replace them. And if it's done in, in a sensible, judicious way, you can get enough bees to raise four or five colonies out of this thing. Um, now, going back to the strength of the nukes, we talked about the three different ways of, of starting nukes um, in, in terms of how strong they need to be. Uh, you know, I've seen people try to raise uh, a queen, you know, bees in, in, in nukes and let them raise their own queen up with a frame or two in there and shake a few bees in there. Like, well, that's not, that's not happening, okay? So that's not anywhere near enough bees to raise a decent queen. If you're going to use the principle of let them raise their own queen, I think you need to have a colony that's at least as strong as this this puppy here. Um, he, he's looking at a good solid three three frames of brood, preferably maybe four or five frames in there, and enough bees to cover the whole thing. And, there, and the reason for that is because they have to feed these queens, and they're going to raise more than one, you know that. When they start raising emergency queen cells, they're going to raise six, maybe even twelve. So they have to have the resources. And if they have to skimp on the resources, you're going to get a, a small, uh, you know, not that good of a queen. So if you're doing this principle, or for example, like when I talked about at the very beginning, dividing the hives 50-50, if you divide the hives 50-50, you know you got enough bees in there to raise a decent queen. Um, in, in fact, it's overkill. you got way too many bees invested in that process. Um, so it's much better to make a nuke with four or five frames uh, if, you're if they're supposed to raise their own queen. Now, if it's a queen cell you're introducing, you want it a little bit weaker than that. You want it like two, maybe three frames of bees. Because bees, the more bees that are in there, the more they are apt to try to take things into their own hands. Essentially, the smaller the colony, the easier it is to push them around. Okay, so we've got three frames of bees in here. We introduce a queen cell. There's a great deal more likelihood that they're going to accept it. Now, I know there's a lot of people that make full strength colonies and add queen cells to them, and they swear that that works. But I'll tell you one thing, most of those guys don't go back and check, okay? So they don't really know whether that queen, that hive accepted that queen cell or not. They didn't keep notes. They didn't go back and check. All they know is they came back in six weeks, and there was a queen in there, and they were happy, okay? So that's fine. Um, I don't have to quarrel with that. Um, if you're using a mated queen, th this unit is still a good size because uh, you know, bees, you're introducing a mated queen from unknown source, maybe it's from Honolulu, 
maybe it's from Florida. This is a completely foreign queen to this colony. And depending upon how long they've been queenless, um, they may think this thing is, uh, you know, an invader. You know, I mean, this, where did this queen come from? This is not our queen. And so if the unit has set, been set, setting their queenless for a couple of days, they're probably in a pretty good condition to accept a new queen. But a lot of times we don't have time to make up the new and then come back a couple of days later and introduce the queen. People want to make up the new, put the queen in at that time. You know, it depends upon how much time you have. It depends upon the timing as to when the queens come, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So making up a three to four frame uh, new, it, it, the thing is going to be more willing to accept uh, an, a foreign queen than a much larger unit. Is what I'm saying. Um, so the, the three, three to five frame nuke is, is become standardized for dividing colonies for a good reason because this is the size of it's going to be strong enough to develop. And it's going to be weak enough that you can kind of push it around and tell them what you want want them to do. Yeah, sure. When you pull the three frames of bees out of it, out of the hive that, right. you, that you have, uh, you pull them out in a checkerboarded form so that and then squeeze everything together and then put frames here you know, or put or put you put in like the, the frames with comb, dark comb in in the middle, I guess is what I'm to get Yeah, out. yeah, okay, so we'll get to that. Okay. Uh huh. Here's what happens when you um, make a two-frame nuke and <laughs> forget what happened. You know, forget it. Um, yeah. So that's a good question. What he, what, what he, what he's asking is, you know, which frames of brood do you take, and um, you know, how do you restructure the hive after you've been there? So, so basically, um, you know, taking brood out of a colony is not a light matter. If you carry away the queen, you, you, you've screwed that hive, you know, if you didn't have a plan for that. And I, I remember working for, with a professor, and I, I, li I, like, I like professors, okay? I, I just don't like what they do. Um, he, he used to come out once in a while and make device with us. And, and he would say, I, yeah, that one's ready. I said, did you see the queen? He goes, well, well, all the frames that I looked at didn't have the queen on them. Mm -hmm. That's not what I meant. I said, did you see the queen? Because if you didn't see the queen, I don't trust that those frames don't have the queen on them. I just don't, okay? So when, when I'm making splits, I want to see the queen before I take a single frame out of that hive. And it's, it's a nice idea that when you're going to a full strength colony and you're making splits, find the queen as quickly as possible and put her in a nuke box. Set it away from that so that nothing happens to her. Because, you know, I mean, the stupidest thing for you to do would be to take the queen and put her in one of the new boxes and then add another queen. So you got uh, one queen, hive of two queens, and you know damn well that as soon as that queen hatches, gets out of that cage, she's going to kill it. So you, you've lost that one. In the meantime, the colony that was the parent, she doesn't have a queen. So you've just completely screwed up the whole thing that way. So basically, I want you to find the queen before you start pulling brood out of the hive. Um, you can't do that, you know, um, I have a plan. The very end of this talk is my surefire plan that anyone can use to divide hives anytime, no matter how new the beekeeping they are or how stu <coughs> stupid they are. Um, and I, don't get me wrong, you know, not everybody is a rocket scientist. Some people just want very easy plans that they can learn and memorize in one sentence. Um, so, anyway, back to your hive. What I try to do is take the best frames. And what I mean by that is the wall to wall brood frames, you know. Um, these, if you're going to take frames, you might as well take the good ones. And they'll be wall to wall brood. You'll have some of the frames will be brood that's just about to hatch out, you know, where their heads are coming out of the cells, you know, the little antenna like that. Because those are going to hatch out right away. And if you didn't get quite enough bees into that new, they're going to hatch out right away and they're going to strengthen that thing. And, and, if, and if you're going to be making a nuke where they're raising queens on their own, you've got to have some eggs in there. You know, uh, if you have, if you can see eggs, then you know you have larvae at the right stage and the whole, the whole bit. If you can't see eggs, um, better get better glasses. Um, <laughs> seeing eggs is very important for a variety of diagnostic reasons. If you can see eggs and they're laid in the bottom of the cell, you know, like right in the middle of the cell like that, then there's a pretty good 99% bet you've got a laying queen in there and she's decent. Okay, so seeing eggs is one of the things that I hammer home 
you know, to all my in all my <coughs> workshops, and people say, "Ah, oh, I can't see those eggs. How come you can see those eggs?" I said, "Well, you know, they're 2.75 reading glasses. If that's what it takes. That's what it takes. You know, when I was a kid, I could see anything. Now I, I have a crutch. But anyway, um, back to your question. You got the brood out of there. You found the queen. You got the brood out of there. What I like to do is fill those empties in with drawn comb." for the same reason we talked about before. Um, that I know those bees will start using that. It's a, it's a very bad idea to, to break up the brood area. So if you have brood over here and over here and stick drawn comb in the middle, unless you're really an experienced beekeeper, it's best to keep the brood consolidated as far as possible. Because you know, a colony of bees is a sphere, essentially. And, and they, the warmest part is in the middle, and so, they, they, they expand the brood nest outward like this. And if you break it and put something in the middle like that, you've completely brought, blown their system. Now there's certain times of year when you can do that, and, and, if, and if you know when those times are, then you're fine. Uh, basically if it's really warm and you know the nights are gonna be warm, it's not gonna hurt them, okay? Or if you know it's in the 80s, it's not gonna hurt them, but probably not a good idea anyway. So I would take what's left, of the, the brood frames that you rejected, push them together in the middle, and then flank that with your drawn combs. And if there's honey, you can either put, flank that on the edge. Usually a brood nest shouldn't have more than a couple frames of honey. You know, if there's extra frames of honey, like if it's like five frames of honey in the brood nest, you have a problem. That's called honey bound, right? You've heard the term honey bound. Honey bound means that the brood combs have got filled in with honey. The queen doesn't have any place to lay. And if you're using a, a, a hive with all the same size frames, whether they're deeps or mediums, you can move that honey up, 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 up like that and get it out of the uh, brood area. If you have deeps and mediums mixed up and you have big solid frames of honey like that, uh, that's a bit more of a problem. What you can do is you can you collect those and put them in a deep box and then just set them on a colony at, you know, at, at, as a place to, to stash those frames of honey. And, and really, well, now that you mention it, having frames of honey is something that almost never, nobody <coughs> thinks about. You know, like for example, I wish I would have held back 10 or 20 frames of honey uh, last fall, because then you, if you find a hive that's getting l light, you can just drop a couple of frames of honey in there. That's the easiest, cheapest, and quickest way of feeding a hive, is just drop a couple of full frames of honey in. And yet, you know, in, in, at harvest time, you think, man, that sure would look good in glass. You know, so, uh, you, you almost always forget to say back, and then you, you have problems with vermin and all that sort of thing. So I didn't mention about making these nukes. You sh uh, when you make a nuke, you should have at least one frame of honey in there because that's going to be their insurance policy uh, against, um, you know, lean times. Shouldn't you also have a frame of pollen? Pollen I don't worry so much about because normally when, bee when the bees create their brood area, they, they provision it with a ring of pollen around the brood. Um, you know, basically you're, you've got your queen laying and, and they keep the pollen very close the brood area because the nurses live in that brood area and the nurses have to consume pollen in order to produce the brood food. So they try to, the, the, the pollen foragers come in and arrange that pollen in a ring around the brood area. Uh, when you see a whole solid frame of pollen like that, that's not exactly normal. That's probably they're, they're bringing in so much pollen that they've started to store it away from the brood area. And it, it's an interesting fact that bees will gather pollen up to a point and then stop. Whereas with honey, they will gather honey until the cows come home. If they have 10 st stories and honey's coming in, they'll put 10 stories of honey. But once they reach about one kilo or two and a half pounds of pollen, they stop bringing it in. And there's two reasons for this in my opinion. One is because it spoils. If they can have fresh pollen, why would they have stored pollen? So they don't store a lot of pollen because of the spoilage. The other thing is that bees are just nuts about honey. You know, get, it does something with their minds. Um, you know, honey, honey, let's get as much as we can. And but it, there's a reason for that, of course, is that their instinct is telling them that um, they can live a long time. They can live two years on on honey. But the pollen, they only need the pollen when they're re reproducing the bees. So some studies have shown that they store very little pollen uh, for the use over winter. As a matter of fact, of course, you guys don't know anything about winter. You've heard of it though, right? You've heard it's of it. It's on TV. 
Yeah, yeah. So here's what happens in the winter, real winter. The bees go into the um, fall with 80 pounds of honey, if, you've been, if you haven't been a skin flint. And um, they're, they're ready for that. They don't store where it's pollen. In fact, sometimes you'll see frames of pollen, you'll think, oh, they've stored that for winter. But, but in my opinion, what happens there is that foragers are going gangbusters on bringing in pollen, like this and this and this, and then the brood <coughs> nest all of a sudden gets cut back because the queen stopped laying in the fall, and they have all this pollen. It's sort of like, okay, let's stop now. Well, we can't stop, and they bring it in, they bring in a couple extra pounds. But the fact of the matter is they don't use that pollen in the wintertime. When they start producing larval food, they use fat from their own bodies. They deplete themselves producing the larval food for the first rounds of brood at the beginning of the season. They don't really start raising brood in earnest until fresh pollen starts coming in. So nothing starts the bees, bees off to growing as much as fresh pollen. Um, so I, I don't know how much time I have. I wanted, to I wanted to talk a little bit about some other ways of dividing. Uh, there's, a, um, there's a great technique that I learned from a friend of mine in San Diego County. County. Hi, San Diego. Um, <laughs> my friend Alan Mikulich taught me this way of, of dividing. What, and anyone can use this with some slight modifications. What he would do is he would take a bunch of hives, put them on the truck, and take them somewhere else. And the reason for taking them somewhere else is when they get off the truck, they don't know anything about their surroundings. See, so one of the problems with dividing in place, you know, in your own home yard, is bees have a tendency to go back, back to where they came from. So it's really hard to get them to stick on a new spot. So what he would do is he'd take them to a place that they didn't know anything about, set the hives off quite wide apart. For example, if the space was as big as this room, you put one over here, put one over here, one over there, and, and quite wide apart. So then what you do next, mark your hives, one, two, three, the chalk or crayon. Um, and then what you would do is put about nine or ten empty hives in a circle all around incorporating that first hive. So now you have as many circles as you have hives to begin with. So if you had ten hives to begin with, now you have ten circles. And each one of these would be marked with that same, because you don't have to mark them now because you know they all, they all belong to that one circle. So then the next step is to take, just divide it as far as it'll go. You don't have to look for the queen, just want to make sure each one of those units has a couple of frames of brood, uh, some honey, some bees, and, and even them all out. And then what he would do would be come back in three days with the queens that he had purchased for that purpose. And all you have to do is start going through that circle. And as soon as you find one with eggs, you know you found the one with the queen. You never have to find the queen. All you have to do is find the one with eggs. Mm -hmm. And then you put your queens that you bought in all the others. So it's, a, it's anyone can do it, you know, and and it, it works really well because the bees tend to orient pretty much at random. Um, you know, they don't have there may be a few more bees in the one of the queen um, because they sniff her out. But, uh, hey, she's in this one. You know. But um, under ideal cir circumstances, they'll be pretty even, and that takes almost no no smarts. Um, I think of a. Yeah, okay, so the, the, the variation of this one I learned in, uh, in uh, New York State. This guy told me he did almost the same technique, but he didn't like to move them to another yard because uh, that was extra work. So he said that <coughs> the way to prevent the bees from going back to the original hive, so let's say you had your 10, 12 hives here, and you wanted to divide them up into large groups like I just described. What he would do... He said, all you have to do is just change everything. <coughs> Where the original hive was, nothing. Just move everything and scatter it all about. As long as you don't have a hive where the original hive was, they have nothing to go home to. So they start randomly distributing themselves throughout these hives. And, and I've tried this, and it really works. You, you, you know, you can completely, it's called, um, what do they call it, nuking or, or busting up the yard. Just take and reorganize everything, distribute it distribute it as evenly as possible and you can go from from 10 to 100 that way even in the same spot and they'll be pretty evenly distributed of course the problem of distribution you'll find out about that over the next couple of weeks some will have more than others and you can do some evening out uh, one of the easiest way to even the hives out after you've made up these nukes is if you have a strong one here and a weak one here you can pick the one hive up and swap them 
so that they, <coughs> the, the weak one will get the feel force of the strong one, and the strong one will get the weak feel force of the weak one. Yes? Just to be clear, you're talking about taking a good strong hive and dividing it into ten. Ten. Mm -hmm. So you don't have that big strong hive anymore. No. Now you have ten new boxes. Correct. One friend each. No, no, you want to be, you want to, if it's a strong colony, you're looking at, I'm talking about 20 frames. You should have enough, you should have enough brood to distribute it. If you don't have enough brood, you're not going to get that far. You know, whatever you have enough brood, you know, don't misunderstand me. You can't make something out of nothing. But you distribute the brood as far as you can. If it's two frames of brood to each one of those, uh, if you don't have that much brood, uh, you're not going to get that far. You have to be flexible in this technique, you understand. Um, well, an in interesting thing about this is you, you say to yourself, well, you know, uh, those are going to take forever to build up. And that's what I used to think. I used to think, you know, you start a frame, uh, a nuke out on two or three frames of bees, they're going to take all summer to build up. And, and the key to this part is timing. Again, and then with timing, I can't tell you anything about timing. Because, you know, I'm from upstate New York, and the timing is different uh, from... Uh, Southern California, Northern California, <coughs> Arizona, and Nevada. Um, but the main point is that when bees are building up, and starting to swarm, you know that you're in a good, you're in a good curve, you're curving upwards in terms of their desire to grow. And when honey and pollen is coming in, and the days are lengthening, they think, you know, spring is coming, summer is coming. This is time to grow, and that's when you try to exploit that desire to grow. And you can start bees off of very small numbers of star colonies off of very small number of bees at that time of year. And part of this is because instinctively they, they know that they can come back from that small unit. In the tropics it's very common to see very, very small colonies. And <coughs> they don't have to be real large because they don't have a, a winter to fight for. Uh, you know, the reason why our colonies get so large in New York State, I'm talking about sometimes five or six deeps, all bees. The reason why they do that is because they know that there's a hard winter coming. And it takes a lot of bees to put up, you know, hundreds of pounds of honey. Ironically, those bees don't get to ever share that honey. So what the colony does is it grows into a huge colony in the summertime, cre uh, harvests a huge amount of honey in the summertime, and then those bees just die. Uh, they have what's basically a timed destruct. They live for about six weeks. We used to think that the bees would live for six weeks because they just wore themselves out. And that's logical enough. They come home, they got ragged wings and stuff like that. But it's been discovered over the years that even if they don't have a harvest, they still die at the end of <coughs> six weeks. Even if they just sit around the hive for six weeks, those bees die at the end of the harvest because they're programmed to die. They don't want these bees in the hive in the wintertime. In the wintertime, they want about one-third to one-quarter as many bees. They all get to share this honey that the summer bees work. It's like getting rid of the migrant workers in, in the fall. We don't need you guys anymore. <coughs> Just go back to where we came from. Um, so this is this is really true. So your your summer bees tend to live about six weeks. Your your winter bees, your fall bees, tend to live about six months. It's the same bees. So what what, what is going on here? And so this is a, an excellent model for under, for studying longevity. You know, the, the, uh, people like uh, 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 Dr. Amdam down here in, in, in Tucson has taken uh, on the honeybee as a model for studying uh, longevity. And she gets a lot of money, uh, research money from organizations that are interested in, in longevity and the human species and any species. You know, it's a, it's a major a mystery as to why, why longevity is different for different species. And in the case of the honeybee, you got a honeybee that lives six weeks, the summer bee. You got a honeybee that lives six months, the winter bee. You got a honeybee that can live six years, right? Queens used to live five or six years. Uh, why they don't live so long anymore, that's the topic of another discussion, right? Um, but we, everybody's talking about that. Why do, why do queens, uh, why do bees not live? Um, does anybody want, want me to talk about queen grafting? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, perhaps we th could take a bit of a break yeah. and uh, come back to it in a few I'm, minutes. I'm, I'm down with that. You guys ready? Yeah. Yeah, we left off with this picture of my, a friend of mine raising queen cells. There's it, an interesting story behind this guy, Mike, my, my friend Mike. Um, uh, he and I met working up in Reading, uh, working for a very large uh, scale queen uh, breeder and package bee producer. 
and uh, we were sitting around talking about about different things. And I said, you know, the first beekeeper that I worked for was one of these guys that had like three four two-ton trucks with the steak sides. And, and he goes, were they green? And I said, yeah, as a matter of fact, they were green. He's, the first beekeeper I worked for, you know, his idea, he hired you. If you could drive and speak English, you were perfect. <laughs> and he would hand you the keys to the truck, smoker and a veil, that's all we got. We didn't get a bee suit. And you were a beekeeper. And we would go around opening up 2,000. He had 2,000 colonies, no permanent help. All greenhorns knew nothing. And so I described this to him. He goes, green Ford, two tons, right? Yeah, yeah, this is up, upstate New York. He goes, that's the same beekeeper I worked for when I first started out back in the 70s. And I go, that's, that, that's ridiculous. That's, that's ridiculous, because here we are in Northern California. And, uh, but it was true. We had both worked for the same beekeeper, but not at the same time, so we had never met before. And then flash, fast forward to the 90s, and um, I read this article in the American Bee Journal, but by the way, if you don't subscribe to the American Bee Journal, you know, get a clue. Um, <laughs> this, I, I write these articles for people to read, not just for me to, you know, read and, 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 and gloat about. Um, and so, so I, and actually I will, I will send copies, or, you know, reprints to anybody that wants them. I think the, my email address is on the last screen. Um, and I could send you PDFs of the articles that I have written. I think I've written about 20 by now. And I'm not as prolif prolific as Randy Oliver, but I think my articles are more varied, okay? Um, never mind. Um, so um, fast forward the American Bee Journal, 90s. I read this article by Mike Johnson. And I go, Mike Johnson, where is he now? He's about an hour from where I'm living now. So we both learned beekeeping in New York State, went to California, and ended up back in New York State. And so he's got about 200 colonies, something like that. And he, he's, he raises queen cells and divides his bees every spring. And, and, and it's an interesting thing. He, when you go to buy nukes from Mike Johnson, you go out there, you gotta go around the yards with him, he'll pull a frame and brood out of this one, he'll pull a frame and brood out of this one, he'll take a queen out of this one. This goes on all day long. You know, you gotta spend your entire day with him to get a couple dozen <laughs> nukes. Um, <coughs> if you raise nukes, and especially if you raise nukes for sale, Sale, you have to have a system, and not that system. Okay, <laughs> when, when when I raise stuff to sell, I want the stuff ready. The people come, the money's exchanged. They take the stuff, they go away, and not this interaction. Um, <laughs> so anyway, uh, raising queen cells is a, is a particularly fine art, and I always tell people, you know, it's just as hard to raise a hundred queen cells as it is to raise a. 10,000. It's all the same procedure. It's, 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 it's not complicated, but it's extremely demanding. So I really don't think that we're going to talk about that tonight. Um, if you want to re read, there's some great books on how to raise queens and make queen cells. Um, I really think that it's, it's a terrific subject for another discussion. But this is a picture of him. You know, basically you transfer the larvae into the cups. Um, here's a close-up of a a super nice batch of queen cells that he's raised. These will all be the same age, like I said, and typically a beekeeper will leave these into the hive, in the hive until they're almost ready to hatch, and then move them into an incubator for that last day. And the main reason for that, I used to use an incubator, just a small poultry incubator, it didn't have to be fancy. I like to do that because, first of all, if one of them does happen to hatch, it's not gonna hatch in a colony of bees and wreck everything, and believe me, if a queen cell hatches in your cell builder, it's ruined everything. She's a, she's a rogue. So you take them out before they're going to hatch, then you have them in the incubator, and then they're in a safe place so that if you have a pouring down rain day, uh, you, you, you know, they're protected. You don't have to go out into the hive in the rain, for example, to get them out on the last day. Uh, so using an incubator is a terrific idea. Um, here's a close-up. You can see here, he's using these plastic cups. I never really got them. Got, got, never really took to the plastic cups, but I think by far the, that's the most common technique now. You transfer your larvae into the plastic cup, and then they're introduced into a, a cell building colony, which which is um, a colony that just wants to raise queen cells more than anything else in the world. Um, so so um, 
Does anybody have any questions about queen rearing that I'm not going to answer? <laughs> no, I'm serious. I'll answer. That. No questions about that. Good. Um, so, yes, sir. On, on each queen that you particularly want to rear, uh huh. What's the percentage of nurse bees that you should have, like frame wise? Yeah. So that's an extremely technical question. Um, no, but I'll answer it because because it's it's interesting. Okay, so the way that this, this particular technique is called the Doolittle method, it was developed by uh, um, um, Gilbert, <laughs> Dr. Doolittle, <laughs> Gilbert Doolittle, of, uh, who, lived, he, who lived in the 1800s, about an hour from where I live in upstate New York, um, one of the Finger Lakes, so it's kind of dear to my heart. Um, he came up with the idea of, con of controlled <laughs> breeding, where you select the larva, you select the colony, you select the mother, you select everything. And what he did was he would put the queen <coughs> in, in a brood nest below the queen excluder, and in an upper story, he would create another little brood nest and um, introduce maybe 10, 15 queen cells into this brood nest. And so that was a good fit. You got two stories of bees, good strong colony, and 10 or 15 cells. Well, that you know, that's not going to cut it for a commercial operation. They want the colony working way harder than that. They want to get 50 to 60 cells out of a colony each batch. So the colonies have to be much stronger than that. So when I when I did it, I sold queen <coughs> cells for a living. I had 10 cell builders, you know, like row of 10 hives like this. And my hives were, did not have a queen in the bottom half. My hives were all queenless. So they had no brood, no queens, they had honey and pollen. They, and, and while the season was early, I fed them constantly. So I mean, I had a, one of those, have you ever seen those black plastic feeders that fits down in there? takes the space of one frame, mm -hmm. and I kept those things full constantly. So there's always syrup coming in. And the reason for that is you don't want those bees to ever, ever think that they're not going to get enough to eat. Because as soon as they do have a shortage of food, they cut back on the number of queens they're going to raise, raise. So I was able to successfully raise uh, 45 queen cells at a time with each one of these 10 hives. So I'm looking at 450 queen cells per batch. And I would do a batch every three or four days. So you put 450 cells in, and then three or four days later, what I would do is go to my regular colonies and shake bees. So I'm shaking bees out of the brood nest. I would shake these bees into these cell builders so that you have a whole new batch of queenless bees introduced into the same hive. So you've got like two or three pounds of queenless bees being introduced into this hive every three days, three or four days and the cells going in at the same time a few hours later. And then you can keep the cells in there, the ones that are being sealed off. They don't have any influence over the ones that are being started. So you have, you know, you have your new batch, you have a batch that's three or four days old, and then you have a batch that's, you know, like a week and something days old. Then when that one starts to mature, it goes into the incubator, and then another one comes in. So it's a whole cycle. But for just raising a few queens for your own <coughs> use, you can do it the Doolittle way, which is you introduce these queens into an upper story, and they raise 10, 15 queen cells. They're beautiful, and then you move them to your hives. So it is something that individuals with only a few colonies can learn to do and, 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 and develop the skill. Um, I'm not sure it's really worthwhile, but if you think it sounds like fun, if you think it sounds like something you want to do, that's definitely doable. And one, one refinement over the, the Doolittle method is he would have the lower story, the normal brood nest, and the queen living down there, and then the upper story, where it's separated from the brood nest by a queen excluder. So they feel somewhat like, we have a queen, but we haven't seen her in a long time, so they're prepped to raise a queen of their own. That's a nice trick, but it doesn't always work. Um, <coughs> there is a refinement that, that you can do, which is to have, they have this thing, uh, uh, it's called a cloak board, C-L-O-A-K, cloak board that has a slider that slips in there. So you set the thing up, you slip that in there, and the upper story thinks, oh my god, now we really don't have a queen. And so then they will start the queens, and then you can pull the slider back out, and then that colony comes up and feeds those cells. So it's a bit of a sleight of hand trick. Yeah. So like first starting, like you were saying, you could cloak board it, because mm -hmm. you, you have to have a queen list for when they first start their cells, but then to finish it off, you could have them think that they're you can leave the queen down below with the queen exploder. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a, it's a, 
it's a, you know, it's a magic trick. So uh, anyway, now, um, one of the things that I wanted to emphasize, if you're going to divide colonies, don't divide colonies that are not healthy, okay? This seems like a no-brainer, okay? So, so I, I've talked, I worked as a bee inspector, and I've seen this over and over again. People, yeah, I ask people, did you inspect these colonies? Oh yeah, I looked at them. That's not inspection. Inspection is where you, you diagnose the brood. Is this healthy brood? Is this a marginal brood? Is this brood sick? And, and people, they, I, uh, this one guy, he had divided up all of his colonies, and he was selling nukes. He was selling hundreds and hundreds of nukes. And I said, did you inspect this brood? He goes, yeah, when I was dividing, he had a full-time <coughs> job. He was doing this work in, late in the evening. You can't see anything. He basically, he was seeing, yep, it's got bees. Yep, it's got bees. That's not inspecting. And, and this is his yard. This is a true story. This is his yard. You know, he's just setting them out in the weeds here. That's his, his, his the parent hives are there. These are the nukes that he's making. What he was doing is pulling brood out of these colonies, putting them in nuke boxes, and adding a, 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 a mail order queen. There's nothing wrong with that. That's a good way of making money. It's a good way of making nukes. Everything was fine with that except for this. This is American fowl brood. This guy was taking hives that had American fowl brood. Um, I've got to put, plug in my charger um, or else quit. Do you have a power source? Yeah, dumb man. Out of, out of the place. Yeah. Got pretty, I'll do it. You on. Yeah, we got pretty far in the battery, didn't we? I guess we did. Sure. Right. Yeah, okay. So he was selling nukes like this? He was selling fowl brood? Yeah. Not this bad. <laughs> <laughs> this guy got in a lot of trouble. Um, so he, was, he wasn't inspecting. This is not inspecting bees. That's a you, cardboard nuke, too. Yeah, the whole thing was a fly-by-nighter. You know, he was trying to do too much. He had a full-time job. You know, I, I, the way I found out about him is that the, the, the head of the inspection department said, we got a call from uh, some, the bee inspector over in Vermont, I think it was Vermont. He said, don't you guys work down there? Don't you guys inspect bees down there? Some joker is selling out nukes, and they showed up in Maine, and they got foul brood. What are you doing down there? So they sent me down to his house, and the way it is in New York State is that inspection is not mandatory. Registration is not mandatory. So I had to go down there and sweet talk this guy into letting me look at his hives. And his first reaction to me was, you know, get the fuck off my property. I don't want you or anybody from the state looking at my hives. And I, and I said to him, I said, you know something, that's okay, except that you're selling Fowler nukes to other states. And he goes, how do you know that? How do you know that? And I said, because they called us and told us. That's why I'm here. You've been reported. He goes, I said, I, you've got one chance here, and that's you can clean up your reputation by working with me. Otherwise, your reputation is shot, pal. And so we, I taught him how to inspect. I taught him how to make nukes that are decent. Because you know what the other side of the coin is? Here's, here's another yard that I, I, I inspected. These yellow stickers are condemned hives. You know, this, this guy, when I showed up to inspect his hives, you know, he had 12, but his 12, maybe his 12 hives. He goes, should, should we put the supers on now? And I said, I don't, I've been in them. They're your hives. He goes, I'm going to load up the garden weight cart with supers. So he loads up the garden weight cart with supers. We go out there. The first lid I pull off, Scott, you know, it's a stinker. I could tell us by taking the lid off. The thing had foul brood stunk. And we went all the way down the road and you could see one right after another. They all had it. He didn't know what it was. He goes, well, I put some of that was it, teramycin on there a couple of times. That didn't work. Here's the, this is the, that was the before, right? Before. After. <laughs> I was actually quite surprised that these two were still alive and that they weren't showing any symptoms. So, and what happened to the, the rest of them? That's what we do. That's what we do in in, in in New York State. Is if they have foul brood, active case like that, that's the, that's the cure. And so, the ca it's a cautionary tale. Whoops. It's a cautionary tale that if you're going to divide hives, you, they damn well better be 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 uh, healthy. And and this doesn't mean just glancing at them in passing. You know, the real way to divide to inspect a hive. And this is what I <coughs> taught people was that. That's the only thing you're doing. 
You're not going to see if they need supers. You're not going to see how the queen looks. You're going to see if they're healthy. And you know, if you look at three frames of brood right from the middle of the brood nest, and you don't see any symptoms of any diseases, you've got a colony that's okay. You don't have to look at all the frames in the whole hive. You know, three frames of brood out of the center of the brood nest. If you've got a problem with foul brood, you're going to find it there. It's going to be off in some corner. I mean, there's a remote chance that it's got off in some corner. But basically, working as an inspector, we got you, in, inside of two minutes, you had all the supers off, you're into the middle of the brood nest, you're looking at the brood, and, and the other thing is, you've got to shake the bees off of it. Now, so many people are timid about that. No, oh, shake the bees, the bees are going to get riled up. You've got to shake the bees off the brood and look at the brood without the bees there. Because so many people I've talked to, they look at a frame of bees and all they see is the bees. Like, wow, bees, bees. We're not looking at the bees, we're looking at the brood. And, oh, brood's gone. Um, the, the, that's where your problems are going to be. And if you've got solid, healthy brood and you don't see any problems, that hive is ready to divide. And, and it would be a very, very smart move to go through and inspect all of your colonies in the spring before you even think about starting to divide them. Yes? Could you describe fellow broods? Uh, I'm afraid you weren't going to... I was hoping you weren't going to ask that. Because <laughs> if you don't know what it is... I, I, yes, I'd be happy to describe the foul brood. And the, all the brood diseases are very similar. Um, basically, when I look at a comb of brood, I'm looking at them like they're a bunch of muffin, muffin tops. Okay, so imagine your, your frame of brood is muffin tops. They're puffy and light, and, and that's the way brood is supposed to look. It's supposed to have a nice ri ri risen top on it. Now the top, as you know or don't know, is made out of just scavenged material. They're recycling material. They use a little bit of wax, a little bit of fiber, a little bit of stuff that they've just scavenged. So the top of the cell of the brood, the top of the brood cell is porous. And so that animal can breathe through that. It's not solid, it's not, it's not airtight like the cap on, on honey. Honey is airtight to keep bacteria out of it. The brood cap is porous so that they can breathe. Now the first thing that you'll notice it, when there's a brood disease is that thing falls, like the mu muffin, like somebody opened the oven and, and, and it fell. Okay, so that's the first sign. You're looking over that frame of brood and you start to see cells that, that, have, that have fallen. And the reason that's happening is because if there's a bee dead inside of there, the bee start walking over that and it starts to fall. It's been dead for a little while. And te they have a tendency to avoid these things, which is not a good idea. You know, it's always not a good idea to, to avoid problems. You know, they should be opening those up and getting that crap out of there. And this is the whole principle of hygienic behavior, is bees with hygienic behavior are highly alert to any kind of problems. So they may be anticipating that bee is getting sick let's get her out of there whereas the you know the more lack you know the more more slackers let's say they go whoa that bee smells bad and finally they go oh my god that bee stinks and it's got to get it out of there so they're not as rigorous with their hygiene so that's what hygienic behavior is it's bees that are like you know attending to the brood and getting the sick ones out of there as quickly as possible and it is possible to have a very light case of a brood disease and not ever see symptoms because they're removing it so quickly and so effectively that it never turns into a real problem. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about what, what happens next. The next thing they do is open up the cell and peek down in there. I, I say peek. Um, you know, the bees use their antennae for smell, right? Their antennae are like noses turned inside out. We draw <coughs> the odors into our nostrils and smell them on the inside of our nose they have the, the organs of smell are on the outside of the antennae. So the antennae is a touching and smelling uh, organ. So they, they can tell that there's something to matter in there by the odor. And so that's the first sign you'll see is sunken caps with a little hole in, in there like that. Whenever I see a, sun, a cap with a hole in there, I immediately take out my pocket knife and start to open it up. Um, there's another way, way that you'll see a, a cell with a hole in it is that when they cap the cell, they cap from the outside and move in like that. So that's normal. You know, when they're capping the cell, at one stage there's just like a little hole. But, but that you, you don't see that that often. Um, once in a while you'll see 
a, a, a cell with a hole in it where they look down in there. So that's the one you want, immediately want to open up. And with foul brood, it's, it's all about the color. So you, brood dies from about 10 different reasons. Now typically brood can die because it um, was, wasn't kept warm enough, chilled brood. Uh, that will die, it, it, but it'll be white. You'll have brood die from a variety of viruses. Normally it's white. Sack brood, uh, chalk brood, which is a fungal, I believe it's a fungal infection, white. Um, so foul brood is one of the few diseases that changes the color of the larva. And it starts out as kind of a coffee cream, coffee cream color. Um, and in the earliest stages, it'll be coffee cream, and it'll, the, lar the larva is, is laying out <coughs> in the cell like this, and they, and they just kind of collapse into a, a mushy little pile. And um, then it'll move into the more uh, advanced stage where it'll be a darker brown, it'll be a caramel color, and then eventually it'll get to be a chocolate color. But the, the sign that proves that you have foul brood or not is the ropiness. Because what this bacteria does is it forms a protein which turns in, which, with the long chain protein, so if you stick a matchstick, for example, in there, it'll string out as, as far as possibly <coughs> an inch. If you don't get that ropey, yeah? Can you describe the smell? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, I can. You know, uh, you read in the old time bee books that it smells like uh, horse eye glue, but who, who knows what that smells like? <laughs> horse eye glue? How long has it been since I've had horse eye glue? But one day I was driving across the, the country, the county, in upstate New York, and I smelled the smell, and I thought, mm. wow, that smells like fall brew. Man, that's, that's it, that's the smell. It was um, roadkill. <laughs> yeah, roadkill on a hot summer day, that's the smell. <laughs> uh, it's been there, it's decomposed, it's rotten. So the yeah. smell of foul brew is rotten <clears throat> flesh. It's, you know, it's bacterial. And back, most of the odors that we associate with decomposition are odors that are coming from these bacterial or fungal organisms. So the smell of barn, the smell of you know a rotten animal, those are odors that are caused by these microorganisms. So that's logical that Falbury would have an odor like that. What was your question? What's the difference between the American fowl brood and European? Yeah, I was going to get to that next. So <coughs> American fowl brood, and irrespective of what I've just told you, I still tell people, if you think you have it, put some, put a little bit of it on a, a toothpick or a matchstick and send it to Beltsville. It costs you nothing. They do that service for free. They will diagnose it. They will send you back a report in a week or two. Uh, they do that for free. And, and, and uh, if you think it might be European, might be American fiber, I don't know, you, you just put it on a toothpick, you put that in an envelope, and you mail it to Beltsville. And the, en the address is available on the internet. They've been doing this for 100 years. They're still doing it. Uh, it, it that's one alternative. Another alternative is to talk to somebody that's seen it before, show it to him or her, and they say, yeah, you got it. No, you don't got it. Um, How many in the room have seen American yeah. I've never seen. Yeah. So this is an interesting this is an interesting question because because back in the day when I lived in San Diego and, and <coughs> Tempe, everyone had it. And and people have gotten so concerned about mites they forgot about all the whole other ones. So so we you know a lot of times when a hive dies they all oh, die to mites. Nobody even goes in there and looks, you know. And so it's it's potentially uh, you know, it could potentially be a real problem because so many people have forgotten forgotten about it or never learned about it. So anyway, the European fowl brood is very similar. It strikes at a slightly different stage. It usually it strikes at a younger stage, so a lot of times you'll see the smaller larvae still coiled up in the cell. So European may, may strike a coiled up larva, and it ge generally tends to turn into a yellowish cast. Yellowish is sort of a straw color, not so dark. Uh, maybe a little bit of a, a brown cast, but usually yellowish to brown, whereas American fowl brood is is, is a, like coffee and cream graduating down to brown, uh, dark brown. And, and European generally, I, I've never seen it rope out. Now I had a case last summer that was ambiguous, what they call an ambiguous case. This guy called me up and asked me what he had, and it was, he was afraid that it was American Falbert. When I got over there, I thought, this is really, it's an ambiguous case. We couldn't quite get it to rope, yet it was very dark brown. And I sent it down to Beltsville, with the with the with the annotation that the annotation that um, 
can we do something about that? You know, the annotation that it was ambiguous, I wasn't really sure. It seemed like one foulbird or another, and it came back positive for European foulbird. So it's not always a sure thing, but generally speaking, the, the American foulbird will rope out, whereas the European won't. And there, there's some other things that you'll see in hives that, that will defy explanation. You know, I had some other cases when I was working for the state where I sent them and I said, I know this is not Falbert, but can, maybe you can tell me what it is. And the report came back negative for Falbert, possibly virus. We don't test for virus. So they don't test for virus. You can get samples tested for virus, but you're going to have to pony up some money. You know, but in Beltsville, Maryland, um, that's in Washington, D.C., they will test your combs. You can send a comb sample. You can sell, send a sample of the goop on a toothpick. You can also send bee samples for testing for nosema. So they still do that. They still do that for free. So don't you know? Don't pay anybody for that. But um, you know, this is just just basically the end of my story. Is that is that don't be dividing hives that have disease because you're just propagating disease. You know, then you become the enemy. Yes, sir. Can, can you describe the rope out again? Rope? Well, there's rope out? You said rope out? Ropey. Ropey. There's tons of pictures of this stuff on the internet. I would just Google images, American Falbert. And generally, you stick a toothpick or, or, or a piece of grass into the cell and pull on it, and then it'll rope out like, like elastic band. Oh, right, right. Okay. It's, it's elastic. It's, um, it's a protein chain, and which none of the other ones have. For example, the chalk root being, being a fungus, it just they just kind of crumple up and then they get covered with that my, my ceiling a little bit. You know, I don't know all the technical terms for it, but, but these things are not hard to, uh, to diagnose. And there's a jillion pictures of all of these things available for free. And the only thing that you have to do is you have to go in there and look. And, and it still surprises me to this day how many people just don't do it. Can you treat the Ameri American fowl group? Or do you just have to... Should you, you treat it or do you just burn your own? Can you? Yes. Should you? Would I? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so every state has a different law about this. Many states prohibit it. Your state prohibits uh, treating foul brood. Uh, the prescription is fire. Right across the border in Pennsylvania, the bee inspectors are allowed to, be, uh, to use their discretion. Uh, if the colony is just starting to break down with it, it can be treated with antibiotics. But now, A, a lot of people don't want to put antibiotics in their hives. And B, this is the most important thing, is you have to be able to tell whether this is a treatable infection. And the average person won't be able to tell that. Now, in, the, in Europe, a lot of beekeep, beekeeping is regulated by veterinarians. So if you have a disease problem, you can take it to a veterinarian. And the veterinarian says, you got, that's, forget it, man, fire. Or that's treatable. So, so that's the level of te expertise that's required to determine whether this is a treatable infection or not. And a lot of people, especially bee inspectors that are just deputized, don't know their right hand from their left, they don't have the experience and the qualifications to say this is a treatable infection. So and under those circumstances, better to just kill it and get rid of it. You know? so, but I'm not going to stand here and say that a bacterial infection can't be treated with antibiotics. Of course you can. That's what they do. That's what they're for. You know, we don't amputate people now because they got they got an infected thumb. You know, whereas they used to do that because people used to die from and from infections. Right in the Civil War, they say more people died from infections than from battle wounds. And antibiotics changed all that. And Falbert is, is a bacterial infection. So by all rights, it should be treated. But the problem with that is that most people wait till it's too far gone and then they spread it all over their apiaries. And so the ba basic policy in many states, not all states, is kill them, be rid of it. It's cheaper to kill them and get rid of it than it is to uh, maintain them. How do you, you know? get it or how's it caused? How is it caused? How do you get it? It's a bacterial infection. It, there's three ways that it's spread. One is from um, <coughs> drifting, and that's probably the least likely possibility. If, you know, if a colony has it and the bees kind of mingle, that's probably the least likely way that they get it, but people always refer to drifting. Um, the, sec the most likely way to get it is the beekeeper did with this guy, <coughs> taking a frame out of a hive and putting it in another hive. The guy's his own worst enemy, right? right? So, but, the, uh, but probably the main way that it's spread 
is through robbing. Because eventually this colony is going to die. And when it dies, it's probably going to leave a box of honey. And all the col colonies in the neighborhood are going get, to get the idea that this is a free lunch. They go in there, they rob out all that honey, they get those spores all over their bodies, they take that back to the, uh, their nest, and that's how it's most likely spread. Well, that's why you see it. Sorry? How's it originate? God started uh, it. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> we have to be out of here at 9 o'clock, so... Yeah. Okay. Uh, we'll have to be